Samuel Johnson, also called Dr. Johnson, for his contribution to the English language. And his greatest contribution that he came up with a dictionary. Now, before Dr. Johnson, there were dictionaries, but his dictionary is considered a landmark. It was published in 15th April, 1755. It contained over 42,000 entries. A critic said 42,773 entries, which was so good at that time. I happened to read his uh, preface recently. So here is a passage from his preface. Preface to this dictionary. The English dictionary was written with little assistance of the learned and without any patronage of the great, not in the soft obscurities of retirement, but amidst inconvenience and distraction in sickness and in sorrow. This passage caught my attention because this tells everything about his labor. And why this? Because when he came up with this dictionary, a dictionary of the English language, you know, he before that, he approached someone, fourth Earl of Chesterfield, Philip Stanhope. Philip Stanhope assured him that he would assist him, right? Act as a patron. But he didn't help Dr. Johnson throughout the labor. Dr. Johnson thought that he could finish the dictionary in three years, but he took nine years. So he didn't get enough support. You know, that's why I think he defined the patron. Uh, this is the definition he came up with for patron in the dictionary. One who countenances, supports or protects. So this is the first definition. A patron is supposed to support someone who is into art. But immediately this is how he defines a patron. Maybe he is thinking of fourth Earl of uh, Chesterfield, commonly a rich who supports with the insolence, I mean rudeness, and is paid with flattery. And after he came up with the dictionary, he wrote a letter to Philip Stanhope. You know, mockingly he said in the kind of, in a satiric way, "Is not a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern on a man struggling for life in water." And when he has reached ground, encumbers or sorry, encumbers him with help. You know, he says, see, a patron is supposed to help someone who is struggling in water, you know, maybe financial waters. But look at the patrons now. Once I reached ground safely, you are trying to help me. Why this? Because the fourth Earl of Chesterfield, you know, tried to help. Dr. Johnson, once he finished the dictionary, he, he also wanted to share the fame with Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson said, thank you. I don't want your help now because I have reached, I have finished the project. So this is an ironic letter to uh, 4th Earl of Chesterfield. Not only this, his birth was also a, a tough one. Anyway, uh, this is a famous definition for lexicographer who compiles a dictionary. A writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge. So that's why he defines a lexicographer as a harmless drudge. Drudge is someone who does the job, the same job again and again and again. Boring. A harmless drudge that busies himself in tracing the original and detailing the significance of words. Uh, I have been reading this book, Defining the World. The Extraordinary Story of Dr. Johnson's Dictionary by Henry Hitchings. If you are interested in getting to know more about Dr. Johnson, his life, you can read this book. I made to finish this book, but it's a beautiful one. So from that book and also from other sources, I have gathered something for you uh, to introduce Dr. Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson was the first child to Sarah Johnson and Michael Johnson. The interesting thing is that these couple, now this couple uh, was childless for a long time. Sarah Johnson was in her 40s and Michael Johnson was, was in his 50s. And they got this child, Samuel Johnson. And Michael Johnson was a bookseller, local bookseller 
in Litchfield. Later, he also became a sheriff and town councillor and other positions. And Dr. Johnson wrote about his birth. I was born almost dead and couldn't cry for some time. So I had a difficult birth and followed by something scary. What happened? Uh, Sarah Johnson couldn't uh, give milk to uh, this baby. So they hired a bed nurse. The problem with the bed nurse, uh, she had tuberculosis. So her milk was infected with tuberculosis. So Dr. Johnson, the baby, uh, drank this milk, so uh, infected with the milk, the contaminated milk. So for life, he was scarred with, uh, scarred by this disease called scrofula, S-C-R-O-F-U-L-A. So he was left with the facial scars. And later, he, as you know, uh, Samuel Johnson was blind in one eye and partially deaf. So against all these difficulties in life, uh, against the financial difficulties and you know, vision, everything, he completed that project in 1754. And you can draw parallels between William Shakespeare and Dr. Johnson. You know, their journey from the native town to London. 1737, Dr. Johnson moved from Litchfield to London, you know, to earn money. You know, I hope you would also remember uh, William Shakespeare. He moved from Stanford upon Avon to London to, get, to earn money. What happened before that? Why this journey? Um, at 25, you know, when Shakespeare, you know, Dr. Johnson was 25 years age, in 1735, he married a widow named Elizabeth Tetty Potter. Uh, she was 46 with children. Uh, Dr. Johnson, just 25. Look at the age gap here. Almost similar to uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare uh, married at 18 to a 26-year-old Anne Hathaway. And he couldn't, uh, you know, he, he couldn't get much money from as dowry, but what he got from Elizabeth Tetty Potter, he invested in a school. He tried to establish a school at Edgel, E-D-I-A-L, pronounced Edgel. But the school didn't pick up, uh, didn't take off. He, he couldn't uh, get, attract a lot of students for, for that school. But one of the famous students he had was David Garrick. David Garrick uh, would become a great actor in that age. So what happened? 1737, not only Dr. Johnson, his student, David Garrick. So David Garrick accompanied Dr. Johnson to London. So two people, student, teacher student, you know, uh, leaving Litchfield to London, you know, to, to achieve in life. So David Garrick called the niche for himself in London as an actor, then Dr. Johnson as a scholar. And let's also look at some of his other works. When we say Samuel Johnson, he's also known for his biographies, short snippets. So you have Lives of the English Poets. It contains uh, biographies, short biographies of 52 poets. And let's discuss some of the famous ones. We have life of Cowley. Why this is important? Because in which he discussed uh, metaphysical poets. And we remember this famous line about uh, metaphysical poets and their metaphysical conceit, you know, far-fetched comparisons. The most ingenious ideas are yoked by violence together. It's not an appreciative one. He says it's a forced comparison. The most heterogeneous ideas, dissimilar ideas are yoked by violence together. So that's how he defines a metaphysical conceit. Then let's look at his poems. So we have London published in uh, 1738. It's a poem in imitation of the third satire of Juvenal, J-U-B-E-N-A-L, Juvenal, a Roman poet known for his satires, collectively called satires. So this particular work, London, is based on the third satire of Juvenal. So earlier in net exams and set exams, this was a question. London, Dr. Johnson's London was based on which satire? I mean, third or fourth. Similar way, we have the vanity of a human wishes 
so that is based on the 10th satire of evinal so this could be questions uh, note this down and i hope you remember horace and its arts poet and his arts poetica horace is also associated with satire there is something called horatian satire h o r a t i a n horatian satire his satire is known for comic ridicule light hearted but evinal and evinalian satire is harsh hard hitting so there is a difference between uh, horatian satire and evinalian satire so read more on the satires then when we think when we say when we think of uh, dr johnson he wrote only one play irene a tragedy and a travel of a journey to the western islands of scotland so that's by johnson then i hope you remember boswell uh, his biographer he wrote uh, the journal of a tour to the hebrides you know uh, archipelago a group of islands then uh, his journal the rambler ran between um, 1750 and 1752 it was issued on tuesdays and saturdays uh it came up with i mean 208 articles were published in this journal so remember this journal because in this journal he produced a lot of essays one of the essays is on actually not the novel the genre called the novel and here is a definition i picked up from his dictionary this is how he defines the novel in in his 1755 dictionary it root from n o u v e l l e novel from french so it means something new this is dr johnson's definition novel a small tale generally of love he has also written a novel the history of rasselas prince of abyssinia subtitle and i mean he defines it as an apologue a p o l o g u e an apologue is a kind of a fable a moral fable if you want to more about uh, dr johnson uh, first you can go for james boswell's biography the life of samuel johnson one who was with him all the time i mean boswell so he came up with the dictionary uh, 1791 the biography was published and from this biography i have picked this passage because it's a very famous uh, anecdote once dr johnson was speaking to miss hannah more and he talked about milton milton madam was a genius that could cut a colossus from a rock but could not carve heads upon cherry stones you know he is commenting upon milton as an epic writer you know he he could he could do gigantic things you know like filmmakers like uh, you know shankar or rajamouli it's like milton milton was a genius that could cut a colossus from a rock but could not carve heads from cherry stones he is not meant for doing you know uh, simple things then another famous work after 1755 his edition of uh, william shakespeare's works published in 1765 in eight volume the plays of william shakespeare so he also came up with the proposals proposals for printing the dramatic works of william shakespeare and for this work he wrote a famous preface so we have to read the preface to understand his opinion on opinions on shakespeare okay. thank you so much